Remember what Jesus said. I didn't come to save those that think, think they're righteous, but I came to save those that know they're sinners and need a savior. So Jesus is really not interested in those that are like, well, I'm right with God. I don't need God. Friend, you know, I, every time somebody does an altar call, I come down to that altar. I, I need God. I want God. I keep myself in a place of humility where if you come to my church and if you preach, let's give everything to God. If you, if you want to give everything to God, come to the altar. I will be the first one at the altar. Isaiah, I will be at the first. I need you, God. I want you. I respond to all the altar calls. I need it more, 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 more. I don't think I'm arrived. I know I need God. I don't think I'm righteous. Oh, I'm self-righteous. I don't need God. It's all, you know, you guys are peasants. You need God. No, I go to God as a beggar saying, Lord, heal me, deliver me, save me. In fact, maybe you don't know this. There's new people, so I'll say this. I respond to all my own altar calls and people laugh at me like, how are you going to preach and then respond to your own altar call? I've been doing this for seven years now. I've been responding to my own altar calls. So I literally will preach and then I'll get on my knees and say, Lord, I respond to my own preaching, my own word. I'm not up there haughty. I, you've seen me guys before at the events on my knees, on my face, first one at the altar because I need God. And if you get to a place where you're not like that, that's where pride sets in. So there's so many teachers and preachers, they're in this place of pride where you'll never see them on their knees. You'll never even say, hear them say they could be wrong. You'll never even hear them say they need God, they need breakthrough, they need deliverance. I will be the first one to make fun of me. Praise the Lord, join the club. If you're like, well, I'm gonna make fun of you for that, get in line, there's a long line of people that make fun of me, I love it. I'm gonna be the first one at the altar. I'm gonna be hungry. Let us have that posture of saying, God, I'm not right with you, I need you. Keep in that place of humility, how low can you go? Of all these things Paul went through, Paul still got saved. And the crazy part is this, in Jesus's day, the prostitutes were getting saved, but the Pharisees rejected him. How is a prostitute have more spiritual perception, spiritual discernment to notice this is God in the flesh, son of God, and then the Pharisees missed it. So don't be a Pharisee. Be someone that says, man, I'm not going to be letting the prostitutes re go, go to Jesus and get saved and the Pharisees not get saved and reject Jesus. It's about being humble. Paul calling the believers saints, it meant they were believers in Jesus. Saint comes from a, G a Greek word that means to be set apart, consecrated, or holy. So it refers to being different. You can't be a saint or a Christian and be the same as everybody else. It contradicts, it's a contradiction. So if you're not different than everybody else you know in the world, you're not a Christian, you're not a saint. So the word saint is used 62 times in the Bible. One commentator said, a saint, my friend, is one who trust, trusted Christ and is set aside for the sole use of God. There are only two kinds of people. This is what a commentator said, two types of people, the saints and the ain'ts. <laughs> Somebody type that in the chat. He said, there's only saints and there's ain'ts. If you're a saint, then you're not an ain't. And if you're an ain't, then you're not a saint, you're an ain't. So you can't be both. You're either an ain't or you're a saint. I wanna be a saint. I wanna be set apart for the purposes of God. I don't wanna be this watered down, lukewarm, fit in, blend in, just like everybody else Christian. I wanna be set apart for the purposes of God. Are you set apart? Come on, are you set aside? Is your life dedicated to the sole purpose of serving Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Ask yourself that, what is the aim of my life? What is the goal? Where is my life going? Is my life headed towards the direction of serving God? I have no other purpose. Friend, I have no, get to a place where there's no purpose for your life other than serving God. Like my life is of no value. Imagine today I decide to stop preaching, okay? Stop ministering, stop preaching. I come, I leave the ministry and my life has no purpose. Like I have no, there's no reason for me to even be here because my sole purpose is advancing the kingdom of God. That's the place where you be, you become a saint or you are a saint is when your life is set apart, consecrated. We're gonna, guys, we've only went through one verse and we've been here 20 minutes. We gotta go here because we got two chapters to go through. I'm sorry. Ephesians 1, 2, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul greeted the Ephesians with two of the best desires that he could, grace and peace. In his day, Greek people began the letters with charis, which is the Greek word for grace or rejoice. Jews use the word shalom or peace, and they still do that a lot in Israel in verbal greetings. So charis stands for grace that results in joy, pleasure, gratification, benefits, and beauty. The Greek word for peace refers to total well-being, harmony, peace of mind, and everything intended for a person's good. So Paul is greeting them with gratification, joy, 
benefit, beauty, harmony, well-being, peace of mind, everything that God's intended for you, that is grace and peace. That's what he's greeting them with. He says, grace to you and peace from God. And remember, the peace that God gives is peace that the world can't offer. This is amazing. The world can't offer the peace that God offers. Jesus said, I have peace the world knows not of. This is not peace the world. It's beyond our understanding is the peace of God. And this is what Jesus Christ offers you. And this is not natural peace. Like peace is amazing, right? When you have peace, everything's going good. This is not the peace that the world offers. This is the peace that God offers and it surpasses all understanding. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, oh, this is good stuff. Hold it. Let's put, put it in park here blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, in the heavenly places in Christ. So verse three begins a very long sentence in the original Greek. There's no periods between verses three and verses 14 in the Greek. So Paul starts out by talking about the spiritual blessings that Christians have and goes all the way to verse 14 in what we would call today as a run on sentence. Paul's going to go Thir uh, what is that? 11 verses with no period of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And Paul uses bless in two ways. He says, bless God and also acknowledge the blessings that God has given us. The Bible says that God has given us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. God has blessed us with everything we need to follow him. This is going to be a life changing revelation for you guys. Everything you need, God has already given you. We live in this mentality that because we don't live the way that we should live for God, we think that we need more spiritual blessings. Let's all be honest here. If I could just get more spiritual blessings from God, I need more fire, more power, more, 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 then I can live the life God has called me to live. But here's the problem. Paul says, God has blessed us with, what does he bless us with? Type it in the chat, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. So like every single blessing literally we could ever get, Christ has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That means, oh man, I love this preaching tonight. I wish there was more people here. That means this, you're not missing anything. Every single one of you that are born again in Christ, you're not missing anything. You're not missing out on a blessing. God has given it all to you in Christ right now. That if you are his child, those who are born again are children of God. John 1 says he gave us the right to become children of God. He's given you every spiritual blessing. But notice this, there's two fathers identified in scripture. There is God and there's the devil. Those are the two fathers identified in scripture. Those that are not born again, this is gonna be a hot take, but it's a biblical take. A lot of biblical takes are hot takes. If you're not born again, you are a child of the devil. Do you want me to say that again for those of you that are sitting in the back that haven't read the Bible in a long time? If you're not born again, you are a child of the devil. Those who are born again, children of God. Those who are not born again, children of the devil. Some people say, well, you know, brother, you said a bad thing about a celebrity. You called them a sinner. And don't say that. They're just children of God. They just don't know it yet. Wrong. That's not. They're the children of the devil. When you look at somebody that's trending right now, like Beyonce, and say, oh, well, she's a child of God. She just doesn't know it, brother. No, she's not. Beyonce, according to your Bible, is a child of Satan is a child of the devil. In fact, the Bible goes as far to say, if you keep sinning, you are a child of the devil. You're not a child of God because John says he gives us right to become children of God. Now, when you are born again, and I'm saying stuff that your pastor won't tell you, it's all good. That's what I'm here for. When you are born again, you become, and God gives you the right to become, I should say it that way, children of God. John 1 says, not natural descent, human decision, or the husband's will, but born of God, born of the spirit. So that's the ones that get spiritual blessings, spiritual benefits are children of God. If you're not a Christian, then I'm sorry to tell you, you are a child of Satan. That's not like a mean thing to say. That's a biblical reality because there's two gods. There's the uppercase G, God. There's the lowercase God of this world. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. That's a real, that's a fact. It's not like trivial. That's not debatable. That's not objective. That is a subjective fact. If you're not a Christian, you are a child of the devil who's the God of this world. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. And I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for that. It's okay. I get it when I preach the word. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Just as he chose us in him. Okay, so I'm going to go kind of slow because it sounds complicated. It's not. I'll explain it all. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world 
that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So this is what Paul is saying. Before ever, anyone was ever born, God knew all about them. Even before, think about this chat, before the earth was created, God knew every single thing about you. Every day was already planned, the Bible says, before the earth was created, God knew everything. God who is infinite, who always existed, has no beginning, knew every single person that will ever be born, that was ever born before they lived on the earth and before he formed the earth, and he wants every person to become his child. But because God wanted each person to choose that privilege, he gave mankind free will, freedom to make a decision about whether or not they would serve him or be saved from their sins. Now, God longs for each person to be a part of his family, but he won't force them. When a person makes that decision, they instantly become holy and blameless in his sight. When you receive Christ, you follow Jesus, you become a son of God, you instantly become blameless. The grace that Paul talks about in verse two, he's talking about something that's available as a gift. It's not earned. So I don't earn the right, like I did something. So now God says, you're my son. The way I become a son of God is I'm born again. I receive Christ through faith by grace and that's what gives me the right, but I don't earn it. It's not like if you pray a hundred hours, you could become a son of God, or you could become chosen. That's not how it works. God wants this for everybody. 